Uh, is that all good to go? Perfect. Okay. Um, good evening, folks. My name is Caleb Wesley, and I'm thrilled to be your invited speaker for tonight. Uh, and I'm really deeply honored, actually, to be uh, asked. And I think one of the things that's really important for me in starting this talk is I want to begin by telling you folks a little bit more about myself, um, why I'm here, and why I was kind of invited to speak in the first place. And so uh, really, I want to begin in that way. And so um, originally, I am uh, I was born in a really far remote community in northeastern Ontario. Uh, I'm a member of Moose Creek First Nation, and it's located um, on a river uh, on an island in a river at the southern tip of James Bay. Um, and so traditionally, my family comes from all around the James and Hudson's Bay coasts in northern Ontario and northern Quebec. But eventually, my family moved to uh, this place called North Bay, which is in central Ontario. Spent a couple of years there as a kid, but eventually my family settled uh, in Toronto specifically in the neighborhood of Rexdale in the city's northwest end. And I was in about grade six at the time. And so I spent a lot of my early years, middle school and things like that, in that kind of suburban Toronto context. And it was in this landscape where uh, that's kind of where I started to grapple with the idea of like not being straight, being queer. And so... It was in that place where I like first came out and started to tell my friends in roughly around grade seven that I was queer. And it was really great actually to have a, a good supportive group of friends in, in a time like that. And I think one of the things that was also really important for me was I was also able to um, like be out all throughout high school. And I had opportunities to like be my authentic self. And so it was a really special time, but at the exact same time, I still felt this aspect of like social isolation and like really deep seated loneliness. Um, I was never really active on things like social media and I didn't really have any other queer friends or like queer folks in school. And so it was just, there wasn't much community for me. And so any of the other out queer folks that I did know, we just didn't really get along. And it was kind of like just teenage angst. You know, when you put like two magnets um, together and they like repel each other, it was something weird like that. And so there was this invisible tension and that really didn't go away until I started to go to university and meet more folks. And so I went to university here in Toronto in 2015, where I went, I attended York University. And it was there where I actually began to connect with a lot more queer folks and a lot more Indigenous folks, actually. And so university for me represents this, this really pivotal turning point um, where it allowed me to branch out in so many new directions. And so... For the first three years of my time in university, 2019, 2016, 2017, I kind of just did what was, what was expected of me. I worked part-time jobs and I attended classes, I failed classes, I changed my minors. I really just like did what university students do. Um, but there was still this lingering thing um, for me, it was just this problem with connect. I wanted to connect with other queer folks. Um, and so I had this long standing desire to do that. And it stemmed all the way back from middle school, all the way back into high school. And it was actually that desire that led me to youth line. And I tell you this story because I want to begin the talk in the way such that one, you know a little bit more about me, but also you hear this a story from one queer youth in Ontario, noting that my story is singular and there's a multi there's a multitude uh, multitudes of queer and trans experiences. 
And so one of the things that I really want to reiterate is that everyone who kind of either connects with Youthline in any of its programs, volunteer or staff, we all kind of have those unique stories of how we came to be here and how we connected with this place. And I wanted to try to capture that multiplicity um, and remind us of that. And so I recall it was the spring of 2018 and I was sitting in a waiting room in Skylark Youth Services at Young and Eglinton. And I was, it was kind of like an L-shaped situation and there was a table right in the middle. And on this table, they had tons of different flyers. And there was this small little leaflet um, about the, the, a, a quarter of a piece of paper. Um, and so you could tell that somebody had printed this piece of paper off and cut it into fours and then they just stack them there. And I imagine that someone from Youthline created this thing and then sent it over to Skylark and they printed it out. But I digress. In sitting in front of me is these little stacks of paper and on them says uh, LGBT Youthline is looking for volunteers for their peer support line. And so I'm sitting there waiting checking out all the stuff and I pick this thing up and I say, huh, well, I've just worked as a camp counselor for about two, three years. I have experience working with youth, a member of the LGBT community. And yeah, I wanted to meet more folks. And so I said, let's give it a shot. And so I took this little piece of paper back home with me to my tiny one bedroom rental. Um, and then I searched up Youthline online and then I immediately wanted to apply when I once I read what folks were doing here. But the applications for new volunteers didn't open until July. And so I had to wait several months in order to actually be able to apply. And so I was really, really excited. I wrote up my application, but I was actually kind of scared that I would forget the date to submit and that I wouldn't be able to volunteer. And so I set a calendar reminder for the first day that applications open. And so that first day comes around, I submit it and do all that. But one of the drawbacks of submitting an application for something on the first day it opens is you have to wait the entire time that the posting is live. And so I didn't hear back until early September. And so roughly about five, six months of time, it, have passed from once I first heard about Youthline to hearing back that I got invited to do an interview to be on the lines. And so I get asked for an interview and uh, it's with some Youthline staff and it was really intimidating. I was 19 at the time, um, like I just turned 19. Um, I had only had a couple of jobs, like all part-time, and I'd actually never been in a room with just solely queer and trans folks before. And so it was really intimidating for all of those things and a group interview at that as well. And so the stakes for me felt really, really high. I really wanted to do this work because I believed in like supporting our youth, but also just connecting with other queer folks. Um, and so I feel like so many of us in the community that's kind of what draws us to this work is supporting this community. And that very much was my sentiment. And so I do the interview, I wait a couple of weeks, and then I hear back that I'm one of the 20 folks that have been selected to join the fall 2018 training cohort. And I bring up this story because I want to share with you, um, like, the, and have you glimpse into what it was like to become a volunteer with an organization like Youthline, because my sto my personal story is just one of hundreds of other queer and trans youth who've come and made up this organization. And so um, now I actually want to talk a little bit more about uh, the process of, of joining the lines and, and training to be a peer support volunteer. So from September to about December, we go through about a three month training process. Um, and it's a really comprehensive 
um, educational experience that covers things like anti-oppression, anti-racism, really broad social issues that deeply impact queer and trans folks. Um, things like uh, access to healthcare, uh, mental health supports, or yeah, there's just tons of things, navigating dynamics in work and school and relationship. Um, we had a lot of really challenging conversations, um, especially around things like coming out or interpersonal relationships or mental health. But at the exact same time, we were having this really comprehensive education. We got to bond and laugh with other folks in our training cohort. And so it was that connection that really made this place special. But in addition to that, um, Youthline also provided us with things like transport um, and things like tokens and things like food. I remember thinking to myself, oh, I'm so glad that I don't need to think about dinner tonight. Um, and so we have got to have these moments between um, during our lessons in the middle there where we would have meals together. And it was those things that had a really big impact on me, having those really awesome connections, those laughs and uh, and sharing meals. Um, our group also was also really social. And so we would often go and get like bubble tea or like other food after our training. And so sometimes we would spend a couple of hours like laughing, relaxing, visiting, just being friends and social after training, there were times that I didn't get home till like 12, one in the morning, just because we were um, all having a really great time. But eventually training had to end and we got onboarded onto the lines. And that's what we at Youthline would call the text, chat and phone service, the lines. And so suddenly things got really, really serious. We as like 2S LGBTQ plus youth, we're going to be on the lines talking with other youth from across Ontario. It's a really like big thing, especially for like other youth to be doing that type of work. And so all of those three months of training were coming to uh, a head and we were getting uh, onboarded to the lines. And what I also want to reiterate is at that time, Youthline was still operating out of a physical location and it still had a physical shift room. And so what that meant is that a lot of the, all of the volunteers and staff who were taking calls and chats, um, we were in the same spot. And so we would socialize, we'd have snacks or make tea between our chats and our calls. And if there was, other periods of longer downtime, folks would do things like schoolwork or, or other work. Um, some folks would sit on this like orange couch that was in there. It was kind of like a plastic leather and they would do like this group puzzle. And so there was a puzzle squad that would be in there and there were people would be doing their readings. And I even know a couple of folks, some of which are on this call that I've caught doing like naps, having naps on that couch during like long late shift. And so I'm reminded about all of those moments. And so I think for folks who were on the lines and in that shift room, that was a place where Youthline truly came alive. And it was kind of the beating heart of the peer support program. And I'm confident to say that hundreds of queer and trans youth from across the province and probably across the world now have been through that shift room. And so once we get onto the lines, um, yeah, we as peer support volunteers, we got to have glimpses into the world of other, into the worlds of other queer youth from across Ontario. Um, there were so many beautiful chats about like love and crushes and self-acceptance, but there were also a lot of challenging chats about things like trauma, internalized self-hate, and like existential and external pressures that they were like, uh, and like really hard experiences. And so since 
Youthline is an anonymous service, we were kind of a vital support for, for so many folks. And oftentimes we were the only avenue of support for folks. And so we got to see how queer and trans folks other than ourselves were experiencing the world, but also support them in navigating that world. And so sometimes we were just there as listeners, um, giving them space to vent. Other times we would work together to come up and generate plans um, for maybe something like coming out or moving out of uh, like a home um, or something like um, asking out their crush or maybe breaking up with a partner or bringing up a challenging topic with friends or family. Um, we'd also help like connect uh, trans youth to healthcare and, and things like that. And we were working across the province. And, and so it required a lot of dynamic skills and being able to meet youth literally where they're at in their own physical locations. And so you never really knew what would be on the other side when you picked up uh, a phone call or a chat. And so you really had to kind of be ready for that. Um, but also during my time as a volunteer, I got to see youth line and how it responded to the COVID-19 pandemic. And during that time, Youthline, like so many other places in the world, had to pause. The helpline eventually came back in mid-2020, late 2020, but as a fully remote service. And so the shift room was no more. Our physical location was still there, but operated differently. But all of the youth and the people that were working the peer support lines, that transformed into a remote service. And so I remember those first early shifts of the reinvented helpline from my bedroom and like needing to lock my door, ensuring privacy and all of things like that. But with becoming a remote service, we were no longer limited to being physically located in Toronto. And so what that meant is we were able to recruit, train, and operate the helpline service with youth from across Ontario. And I remember being so excited uh, that we would be able to bring in youth from outside of the GTA. That was one of my biggest complaints um, while I was a volunteer pre-COVID, was that we were too Toronto-centric. And... I still remember, um, I think it was probably around, yeah, about 2020, when we started to first get our first cohort of new trainees from places like Sudbury, London, Hamilton, Ottawa, and other smaller towns in between. It brought so much rich perspectives, which we were missing, just being based out of Toronto. I still feel that Youth line is missing some more northern and remote um, community representation on the lines, but I think it was a really good starting point and that they've been making a lot of work into making youth line more accessible, more accessible and reflective um, for 2S LGBTQ plus youth. And eventually to kind of continue in supporting that work, I joined as staff um, from fall of 2021 in fall of 2022 as a shift supervisor and online learning coordinator. And my primary responsibility was now to support the volunteers who were taking those chats. But while I'm kind of singing the praises of Youthline's peer support program, um, primarily because that's where my relationship exists with the organization, it's not the only work that Youthline has done um, in the past like 30 years or is currently doing. Youthline has a really long history of community organizing across Ontario. They've helped support youth on the ground through its ambassador programs, like first in the 2010s and, and then again in the 2020s, making space in, in communities across the province. Um, Youthline has helped organize community uh, events that were focused on making space for queer and trans youth in their communities. Oftentimes these were art-based workshops out of places like community centers, libraries, schools, really anywhere. Um, 
Youthline also has a long history of supporting um, like pride proms and like uh, queer prom, trans prom nights across Southern Ontario. And they did a lot of work in the 90s and 2000s to support and uplift to us LGBTQ plus youth leaders in their communities through the youth awards. And so there's this really deep history of community organizing, uh, space making, activism that is deep within the bones of Youthline. And I think if you want to find out more information about that, you can find out more about um, the about it on the 25 Years of Youthline on the Archives website, spelled with a Q. And so that's a really great resource to read more about this great history. Um, and so I bring that up because there's been hundreds of volunteers, shift supervisors, staff that have done work in this organization, oftentimes for longer than a decade. Um, and it's a truly special place. And I'm privileged to have a small, to have a small part of that. But I really wanted to kind of honor all of those stories as well and recognize that this history goes so much deeper and for so much more folks and that are just in this room or listening now. And so one thing that I heard a lot while I was on the lines and within my own self is this, this personal dream for Youthline as an organization. And what this dream is, is so that one day Youthline will be able to continue to grow, continue to support more youth. Um, but also do it in a way that captures the beauty of this organization and the community that it's able to create. And it's my belief that we need more things like Youthline, not just across Ontario, but across the country and the world. And I hope that Youthline, its staff, its volunteers, its board of directors, service users, and the community members that come out to the events, we'll all be able to continue and to steer the organization in a way that honors this great history of activism and community support. And in a way that honors the stories of the folks that make up this organization and the youth that this organization supports through all of its initiatives, because um, like the youth are our future. And I hope that I was able to capture and share the love that I have for this place with you folks tonight. And for the folks with experiences as service users, community members, volunteers, staff, board member, I hope I was able to remind you of what makes LGBT Youthline special to you. Thank you.